The final item of business today is members' business debate on motion 17177 in the name of Richard Lyle on the Alzheimer Scotland report delivering fair dementia care for people with advanced dementia. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to contribute to the debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Richard Lyle to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. As convener of the cross-party group on dementia, it gives me great pleasure to facilitate this debate, and I wish to thank each and every person who signed my motion and those members who are speaking tonight. I want to bring, uh, begin my contribution this afternoon by highlighting the work of the cross-party group on dementia, which is doing an admirable jo job in advancing the debate, and I uh, actually have some members are in the gallery uh, tonight. Indeed, since its formation, the cross-party group has managed to expand the number of contri contributors pulling from across a wide range of stakeholders, including organisations and individuals. The committee contribution from a growing number of people with dementia and their carers is particularly welcome, for example, the Scottish Dementia Working Group. In fact, I'd like to take this opportunity to commend and underline the courage of those who have participated in our discussions despite the difficulty and pe deeply personal nature of those discussions and contributions. We actually set aside time for personal stories, which I, I listened to intently. The group has been and continues to be the most helpful resource in aiding the Scottish Government in understanding the needs of sufferers and their carers and families. As such, I want to thank officials who attend our meetings from the Scottish Government. I would also like to congratulate the excellent report by Alzheimer Scotland delivering fair dementia care for people with advanced dementia, which provides an accurate analysis of the current situation in Scotland. It is right that people in the early stages of dementia are supported to live as well and as independently as possible, with a focus on social and family support and community connections. However, more and more people with dementia are now living longer with it and so are reaching the advanced, the advanced stages of the illness. Advanced dementia is characterised by increasing complex and rapidly changing needs. We need to understand, as Alma, Alzheimer's Scotland report sets out, that dementia is a set of symptoms that are caused by an underlying illness, the most common cause being Alzheimer's disease. Vascular dementia is also quite common and there are over 100 other dementia-causing diseases also. As the Al Alzheimer Scotland report shows, Scotland has made great strides in improving dementia care in recent times, most notably since dementia was made a priority in 2007 by this government. This progress has been forged by hard work, effective contribution at every level, and the contribution of both practitioners and policymakers has been pivotal. However, there are people with advanced dementia who are not receiving the care they need. Their families and even the committee care staff are struggling to support them appropriately. This is because the current system does not recognise advanced dementia as a health condition. In other words, not a side effect of ageing, but rather as a degenerative disease that it is. We must seriously try to address this. Gladly, now reports such as Alzheimer's Scotland Fair Dementia Care are bringing together all the evidence on this, informing us of just that fact. How can we respond to this fact? People with advanced dementia need to have medical nature of their condition recognised and be provided with the health, health and care and nursing care they need. The harsh reality is that we face with today is that the current situation creates inequality for thousands of people living with the advanced stages of the illness. They may not receive the care they need, despite the fact that they would get it if they had a recognised health condition. This means that not only are their needs not met, but they are being charged under the banner of social care for any care they do get, meaning that people with dementia are facing a disproportionate financial burden compared to the people with other progressive terminal conditions. These social care charges, as they are, currently structured, are confusing to service users, they lack transparency, are often not readily accessible on council websites, and the charges themselves vary wildly from local authority to local authority. This lack of consistency and transparency of the financial assessment process is therefore a major concern, and most people who seek information don't understand how the process works, how the charges they are asked to pay are calculated, 
or why, unlike other progressive conditions, they're often subject to charges for the care they need. I hope that the Scottish Government's forthcoming audit social care review will address this, and I'm sure it will. I know that many people will be wondering about the cost implications of achieving this most necessary social prog uh, progress, but it seems to me at this stage pivotal to remind you that this important issue cannot and should not be discussed only in pounds and pence. Behind the simple consideration of the costings of over 90,000 people living with dementia in Scotland who need consideration as well as their carers. For example, Elaine. Elaine's mum, Pat, has been in the advanced stages of a dementia since 2015. Her mum had been going to day-to-day -day centre, nursing home for respite breaks. However, these inconsistent charges to Pat's environment were causing more harm than good, disrupting her mood, making her care even more difficult for Elaine at home. In the end, Pat had to move to, into a residential home. She was there for 10 months at her own cost. In this 10-month period, she had to visit a &E 11 times because her care home could not meet her health needs. On her last visit to hospital, she was admitted for three weeks due to a fractured skull, but still had to cover the cost of her place at the care home during that time, despite the fact that NHS Scotland were meeting her health and residential needs during this period. Elaine says, if my mum, mum had access to the free health care on the same basis as, as those with other progressive illnesses, she would have ha had a better quality of life, which would have saved the numerous crisis interventions, which were not only costly and the stress placed on her and her family, but financially to her and to her health and social care system. The emotional impact of being a carer and watching someone you love deteriorate is hard enough without the added worries of how they're going to pay for their care. After reading Elaine's story, one of many in this country like it, it's surely clear that we need a national stand-up to address this important issue now. This national stand-up must ensure all stakeholders understand the importance of this matter and the subsequent need for rapid action. However, today the time is, right, is no longer right to examine possible solutions, as the solutions already have been highlighted by the report. Now is the time to act and we owe it to our fellow citizens to provide a fair system that lends them the same care and security as sufferers of other illnesses, thus helping them to improve the quality of their daily lives. As the motion states, people with exam de advanced dementia should receive the health care services they need, free at the point of use, as would be the case for any other health condition. I believe our health and social care services should recognise the needs of people uh, with advanced dementia our, care, our health care needs and put in place services and structures that enable those to, needs to be met. Presiding officer, the, the issue of dementia, and particularly advanced dementia, is a central major challenge to our country in the coming years. As pointed out earlier, this debate concerns many women and men who, thanks to the recommendations of the Alzheimer's Scotland report, would see their living conditions improve. This right is a dignified life. It should be remembered, a fundamental right for their elderly, demographic, demographic most affected by dementia and also advanced dementia. In closing, Article 25 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights states, the Union recognises and respects the rights of the elderly to lead a life of dignity and independence to participate in social and cultural life. We must recognise the vital and imminent, na imminent nature of this issue, do everything possible to meet the ex expectations of those directly or indirectly affected that by it. Thank you, President Officer. We'll now move to the open debate and speeches of up to four minutes, please. We have Jeremy Balfour followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer, and can I congratulate uh, Richard Lyle on his motion and secure this debate uh, this afternoon. Um, can I welcome the um, Alzheimer's Scotland report, which I think is really helpful and lays out where we are and where we should be going. Uh, when I was a, a local councillor uh, here in Edinburgh, I had the privilege of being involved with the Christophan Dementia Club and, and being a director there. And I saw the effect um, that early dementia had on individuals and on families. Uh, Richard Lyle has uh, helpfully pointed out uh, the definition um, that many people have. And I think one of the encouraging things, um, in many ways, is that people are now living longer with this condition, thank, thanks to medical science, uh, better care, 
um, a better understanding of the condition. People are living longer, but that comes with a greater pressure. Pressure maybe not on the individual that has this horrible condition, but the pressure that comes from family and friends and others that are supporting it. And I think Richard Lyle very helpfully uh, pointed out perhaps the crux of what we need to look at um, as a parliament and as a society as we go, in, as we go forward. And that is the, when someone has advanced dementia, the care that is required and the cost that that care comes with. And I was interested when reading the report that it does not call for social care charging to be abolished, but it does call for equality. And I suppose this, to some extent, comes to the, the crux of the problem. Um, and that is, as a, a local councillor, former local councillor, I generally believe that local authorities should be able to make their own decisions. But if you look at the report and look what's happening across the 32 local authority, there is not that equality. That there is differentials in regard to not only the type of care, but the costing that that care will cost. And I think we need to have a grown-up debate about how much do we set national guidelines, national standards, and how much do we allow local authorities to make local decisions. And, and often that will be a difficult question to answer. But surely what we do need to get in a country geographically large but population fairly small is consistency. But if I live in Orkney or Shetland, if I live in Dumfries, if I live in Edinburgh, that the type of care and costing I'm getting is consistent across our country. As Richard Lyle pointed out in his speech, there is often on web pages a lack of transparency about what do I need to do, what can I get, what services are there available. And it must surely be possible to have it easily accessible, that where someone gets to the point that they need this care, that it is accessible to them and to their families, and we need to look at all those issues. I do think this debate needs to happen quickly. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes forward later this year from Scottish Government. And I think we have to recognise that the balance that must be got between what national government sets and does and that is left to the 32 local authorities. I also, in conclusion, Deputy President of the think, as we continue to design the social security system, particularly for attendance allowance and for PIP, we need to make sure that people that have this condition are not left behind from others that have similar types of conditioning. So again, congratulations uh, to Richard Lyle, and I look forward to hearing the rest of the debate this evening. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I congratulate my colleague Richard uh, uh, Lyle on securing today's debate and for his years of work as convener of the Cross Party Group on Dementia, which has also looked at advanced stage dementia and how we support those impacted by it in Scotland. Both my grandmothers died after suffering from dementia, and my mother has been in a care home with Alzheimer's for the last five years, so I have a personal interest. I thank Age Scotland for their briefing and Alzheimer's Scotland for providing both an excellent briefing and establishing the Fair Dementia Care Commission, whose report forms the substance of Richard Lyle's motion. The Commission's purpose was to establish how advanced dementia is defined and recognised in practice, to estimate how many people are living with a condition in Scotland, and examine how advanced dementia care is financed today. This is an immensely important work, given that currently over 90,000 people live with dementia in Scotland, a condition often rooted in progressive illnesses like Alzheimer's disease that have no effective treatment and no cure. The effects of dementia are profound on both the individual, their loved ones and their carers who live daily with the physical, emotional and financial burden this illness brings. Yet when it comes to advanced dementia, it is a frequently used but rarely or consistently defined term. To ensure support for those with the condition, it is imperative that we recognise and respond to the healthcare needs that arise during this advanced stage. The Fair Dementia Care Condition Report puts forward a concrete definition stating, and I quote, advanced dementia is associated with the later stages of illness when the complexity and severity of dementia-related changes in the brain lead to recognisable symptoms associated with dependency and an escalation of healthcare needs and risks. 
I believe this is a robust definition and should be incorporated into policy and practice. The report states that healthcare needs and risks include neuropsychiatric symptoms, disorientation, communication problems, multiple function impairments, immobility, incontinence and weight loss. Because advanced dementia has not been consistently defined, it's difficult to estimate how many people in Scotland are living with it. Possibly 35% of people with dementia, with dementia who are resident in care homes, while around 7% of all older people receiving non-residential social care have advanced dementia. Those figures illustrate just how many people are affected by the inequalities in dementia care highlighted by the Commission's work. Indeed, the report found that people with advanced dementia do not have equal access to health care when compared to people in the advanced stages of other illnesses. This is rooted in the fact that advanced dementia is largely met with a social care response and disproportionately subject to social care charges, as Richard Lyle highlighted, despite the fact that their needs are largely health and nursing care related. This approach is costing people with advanced dementia an estimated £50.9 million pounds a year in social care charges, a situation compounded by the variations in charges across local authorities and a social care system that can be complex to navigate. The report outlines key recommendations enabling society to more adequately meet the needs of sufferers with dignity and fairness. Significantly, the report asks the Scottish Government to recognise the needs of people with advanced dementia have health care and not just social needs, which should be met with health and nursing care free at the point of delivery. I understand that Scottish Ministers are already examining this report and are keen to meet with the Commission to discuss its recommendations. I trust the Scottish Government will respond fully to the concerns and questions raised by this report with a view to implementing the recommendations. As Chair of the Fair Dementia Care Commission, Henry McLeish highlighted, and I quote, Scotland is internationally recognised as having some of the most progressive dementia policy. Indeed, Scotland is home to groundbreaking research in developing treatments to slow down dementia and improve the quality of life of people living with it. Presiding officer, we cannot afford to stand still in tackling this great medical and social challenge. Thankfully, work is well underway right here in Scotland. Just yesterday, we heard the excellent news that Alzheimer's Research UK have awarded £160,000 to the UK Dementia Research Institute at Edinburgh University to fund their investigation into the treatment of nerve damage caused by Alzheimer's. We must ensure that advances made in understanding advanced dementia and its symptoms are reflected in our policies and practice. I thank Alzheimer's Scotland once again and Richard Lyle for pressing the Scottish Government to do just that. Thank you. Monica Lennon, followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And like colleagues, can I also congratulate Richard Lyle for bringing forward this important debate and also for the work that he leads uh, on in the CPG and dementia and everyone who's involved in that. I had a, a look on the Parliament website and there's indeed a very long list of individuals and organisations who are involved. So well done to, to all of them. And of course, to thank Alzheimer's Scotland for their report, which we are debating tonight, for giving us much needed and valuable insight, and also to Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland for their briefing this evening. Um, we know there are over 90,000 people living with dementia in Scotland, and this number is rising. There will be few families whose lives remain untouched by this disease, like Kenneth Gibson, who we've just heard from in the debate about his family experience. I know this debate will be important to many people in my region, Central Scotland, people living with dementia or caring for a loved one with the disease. There has been fantastic work in recent years on living well with dementia. This is welcome and, of course, positive for people who have been recently diagnosed. With the right support, uh, people with dementia can live well for months and, and many years in their communities and with their loved ones. But when the disease becomes advanced and increasingly complex care needs are developed, it is important that people are given the care and support that they need. Sadly, as we know from the report, um, this is not happening for people with advanced dementia. And that is simply unacceptable that people in Scotland are not getting the health care that they need, particularly for this terminal disease. Access to health care is not something that people living with dementia or their families should have to fight for. Everyone should have equal access to healthcare free at the point of need. This is why Labour established the NHS um, over 70 years ago. Um, so I agree with other colleagues that the Scottish Government must do everything it can to ensure that all people always have the specialist care that they need. And I know from my own work as a, a counsellor where I previously held um, surgeries in Lanarkshire Carer Centre in Hamilton and working with organisations that friends and family care for their loved ones for as long as possible. 
But with a progressive terminal disease like dementia, there usually comes the difficult point when more support is needed from social care services. And the impact of this decision for carers shouldn't be underestimated. It can be truly heartbreaking for carers and families. Social care um, can provide additional support around the clock care when required, and this gives families lots of comfort. But it is not right that social care is being used when health care should be. Aside from the negative impact on health, it also means that people with dementia are facing a disproportionate financial burden compared to other people with similar conditions. It's telling that one of the most common issues Alzheimer's Scotland are asked about is the cost of care. Social care charging policies, as Richard Lyle has described, can be confusing, can lack transparency and vary across the country. And understandably, that's providing worry and frustration for families. Social care, as we know, is quite a fragile and complex sector. There's a big role for the third sector and, of course, local authorities, but we find that they're surviving on short-term and often decreasing funding models. Social care needs a robust long-term plan with real investment for a service that is increasingly needed across Scotland by our ageing population. In conclusion, presiding officer, again, I'd like to thank Richard Lyle for securing this debate. Um, we all agree, I believe, that urgent action must be taken in response to Alzheimer's Scotland's uh, findings in their report. 70 years on from when the NHS was established, it's not acceptable that we find that one of the most vulnerable groups in our society are missing out on the health care they need. Scottish Labour believes there should be equal access to health care, free at the point of need, and that applies especially to those with long-term terminal conditions. Liam MacArthur, followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Officer. Let me join others in congratulating uh, Richard Lyle, uh, both in securing the debate and setting the scene uh, very well indeed. Uh, can I also add my thanks to Alzheimer's Scotland uh, for their detailed report, which does, as others have suggested, shine a much needed light on the issue of ad advanced dementia. It helps in our understanding of, of the condition, but it also importantly exposes where there are gaps uh, in the treatment and care available uh, to those affected by this uh, horrendous condition. Obviously, as, as people are living longer, um, the numbers we are seeing with dementia and indeed with advanced dementia are on the increase uh, too. The research being undertaken to improve our, our understanding about what can be done to uh, reduce the risks, to slow the condition, uh, potentially to find a cure, um, are, 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 are much to be welcomed. And, and so too is the fact that Scotland is leading the way. However, for now, we need to be doing more uh, to ensure that appropriate care and support is available at the appropriate time. As, uh, Alzheimer's Scotland point out in their briefing, uh, it is right that people in the early stages of dementia are supported to live as well and independently as possible with a focus on social and family supports and community connections. I've seen that firsthand like others have in their own constituency. I've seen that firsthand in, in Orkney where for example, the Dementia Hub hosted by Age Scotland uh, Orkney offers a wide range of activities, uh, therapies, uh, but also just the chance for a cuppa and a chat. It's about sharing experiences, companionship, and of course, uh, gossip. Those with dementia, but as importantly, their family and their carers get a tremendous amount uh, out of the hub experience. Dementia Friendly Orkney also run a variety of events, including the Dementia Cafe, and the famous singing group, uh, as I know to my cost, this is uh, great fun with an, a, an emphasis on companionship, uh, where they have a song sheet, which is a veritable back catalogue of numbers that you cannot help but belt out lustily. Uh, to mark Dementia Awareness Week, shops and businesses in Orkney will be going purple, as too will the iconic St Magnus Cathedral, and a busy uh, week of events from dementia-friendly uh, film screenings to singing, from cream teas to purple planting will take place. Then on Saturday, there will be a game of walking rugby. I have to say that Gillian Skews and Steph Stanger from Age Scotland Orkney are both highly persuasive individuals. So in defiance of doctor's orders, I will be putting on the boots, um, but it remains to be seen whether I'm in any fit shape uh, to take to the dance floor at the Golden Ball Dinner at the Orkney Rugby Club later on that evening. Deputy President Officer, all of that shows the fun side of raising awareness uh, as part of Dementia Awareness Week. 
um, it will hopefully help raise funds as well. But there is a serious message as well. As Alzheimer's Scotland report highlights, too many people with advanced dementia are not receiving the care they need, despite the best efforts of their families and indeed care or staff. A lack of clarity or consistency in social care charges means that people with advanced dementia are often shouldering an unfair financial burden, as others have alluded to. The McLeish report called for local authorities to accept and recognise that people with advanced dementia need a quality of access to free health care on a par with people who are living with other progressive and terminal illnesses. Deputy Presiding Officer, that's not an unreasonable ask. I hope the Minister uh, will agree uh, and that this Parliament can commit to making that happen. In conclusion, though, can I thank Richard Lyle again for allowing Parliament to have this debate this evening. Thank you. Mark MacDonald, followed by Fulton MacGregor. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I congratulate Richard, Ly uh, Richard Lyle on securing this debate uh, in Parliament. Um, say at the outset, this is an issue that has long been of interest to me. My late grandmother uh, had dementia um, prior, uh, up until her passing in uh, 2011, and um, my mother cared for her for a large part of that time. Um, so I've seen firsthand um, the uh, work that has to go into supporting an individual um, who has uh, dementia and latterly uh, advanced dementia, which I think uh, most people would have accepted was the case with my grandmother. And I think the, the report from Alzheimer Scotland is timely and necessary. Uh, I think that it calls uh, rightly for a, a definition in relation to uh, advanced dementia. If we accept that dementia um, is a progressive or some would say a regressive uh, condition which uh, advances through uh, its course, then there will come a point at which uh, the healthcare needs uh, and of that individual are going to become uh, more complicated and require different interventions. Uh, and that, I think, requires a definition to be in place in order to support uh, the health and social care services that wrap around that individual to be able to identify the point at which that care uh, needs to be provided. One of the difficulties and challenges that has been faced and I think is recognised um, by Alzheimer Scotland is the lack of um, work that has been done up until now around research around uh, advanced dementia. For example, a Cochrane review uh, in 2016, which looked, uh, which was set up to assess the effect of palliative care interventions in advanced dementia and report on the range uh, of outcome measures used, uh, could find only two studies uh, to include in the review, uh, both from the United States of America, uh, totaling 189 people. While the report did uh, note that there were six further studies ongoing at the time of the review, it did state that it was, there was in, insufficient evidence to be able to assess the effect of palliative care interventions in advanced dementia. So the need to collect uh, appropriate evidence in order to ensure that the data is there to inform decision making and inform the kind of care uh, that is taken forward uh, is out there. One of the other things that it's worth noting about dementia as well is that unlike uh, any of the other diseases in the top 10 causes of death in the UK, uh, there is no recognised cure nor recognised an official treatment provided uh, in relation to slowing progression. It's, you know, if you detect dementia early, it's not a sign that you're going to be able to uh, cure from it or remove dementia. Uh, it will be there uh, and it will uh, advance uh, throughout the, the rest of that individual's life. The point around consistency and around charging, I think, is one that, that merits consideration. There's always a tension that arises between the need to respect the ability of local authorities and local decision makers to set decisions according to their local priorities versus the need for us to ensure that people in neighbouring local authorities uh, are not being treated wildly differently. And that's a tension that we, we always have to face. However, I think that um, while we possibly couldn't move to a necessarily uniform model, given the variations that would exist between rural and urban communities, I think parameters uh, need to perhaps be set in order to ensure that people have an understanding uh, of what they're likely to face when it comes to uh, charges. But consistency, I think, applies in other ways as well. I remember back in 2012 uh, raising the concerns of my constituent Jeanette Maitland whose uh, late husband uh, had been seen by 106 different carers in the space of a year um, as part of his social care package. 
and that has a, an extraordinary impact on an individual uh, with dementia who uh, often requires uh, and indeed uh, thrives on the basis of familiarity uh, and the basis of an understanding that exists between them and the individual who's providing their care. To have that level of turnover of carer uh, and that inconsistency in relation to the approach of carers uh, can only be harmful to that individual. So when we talk about consistency, charging is absolutely important, but there are other areas of consistency that I think merit consideration as well. I forgot my microphone, sorry. Fulton McGregor, followed by Maurice Corey. Thanks very much, President Officer, and uh, thank, uh, like everybody else says, thanks to Richard Lyle for bringing this important um, issue to the debate, and also want to um, uh, highlight the, the work of Chambers Scotland and put on record my thanks um, to them as well. President Officer, I wasn't originally uh, planning to speak in this debate, so also appreciate um, your, your indulgence in this. Um, I want to actually come uh, from a slightly different angle. Um, a couple of members have mentioned uh, the, 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 the difficulty, that, if, you, if you like, that exists between uh, national strategies and, and perhaps local authority and local decision makers. Um, and I think that the national strategy the Scottish Government has brought forward is indeed um, a really good one. But I think in order for it to work, it needs to be implemented um, at local uh, levels. And I, I wanted to... Um, one of the reasons that compelled me to speak was to speak about a very localised issue that I've been involved in, um, namely East York Gardens uh, in, in Coat Bridge, uh, a service uh, currently, but not for much longer, for dementia patients. Um, and there was a decision recently made to close the, the service there with um, no consultation with patients, uh, family, staff, or um, with politicians. And the, the impact assessment uh, that was later provided after I'd written to the, the minister that, that I know the, the cabinet secretary that I know the minister might be aware of was um, not very detailed, to put it very politely. And I, I think the board have, um, uh, you know, are not, are not going to move o on this particular issue. Uh, and I have, as I said, already written to the, the cabinet secretary to make her aware of it. Not that I expect the decision to be overturned or anything like that, but I think it's very important that the joint integrated board. Uh, and, and Lanarkshire know that, that, that these decisions with this particular patient group um, cannot be uh, taken so lightly in the future. And to give testament to that, I actually held a, a public meeting which was well attended and, and quite uh, charged with a lot of um, patients and their family members turned up. They were extraordinarily uh, upset and angry, um, again, to say the least, uh, about the way that the, the situation had been handled. No consultation, felt that they were kind of an, an afterthought in the whole process. And also that, um, and I, I'm sorry for, um, for the, the localism of, of, of this, people don't know maybe place names, but um, the, the, the whole uh, notion that the patients will just be moved to, to Coat Hill Hospital and Coat Bridge as well, was actually a wee bit of a red herring to get them through a decision because uh, these patients didn't want to go there and it wasn't a like for like service. So that's something that I've been taking up with these individuals. Uh, on, a, on a constituency basis. But one thing that came to me uh, during that and then speaking to Richard uh, and others about it since, and I think it's highlighted through the report that we're debating here today, is this patient group seemed to be treated differently that, that, than others at uh, that, that, that local level. And it did dawn on me there, would all patient groups have been treated less with so little consultation? And I do wonder what the reason for that is, because I have to say, I was quite surprised and I did think or something that will have happened here. I'll get told somewhere down the line there was a massive consultation. I must have missed something, but no, that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and there was actually something uh, very similar as well. Uh, some some uh, families came to me about a supported accommodation issue that, that also went under, underwent major changes uh, through the, the, the local authority, uh, and that was at James Dempsey Court. Uh, also in Coat Bridge, and a, a lot of um, families came to me really concerned now, when I went back and spoke to the council about that, there was a, a difference in the situation. The council had indeed actually undertaken quite a, quite a detailed uh, piece of work around that. However, what became clear is you had two really opposing views on it, families of patients and the council. And I, I think both were probably actually technically correct, but where had that got mixed up? And um, how, how, how can we make sure that they're explaining decisions better to this particular uh, population group. And as I think Richard Lyle and others have said, it's clearly going to be more of an issue as we go together. So to conclude, President Officer, again, I want to 
Uh, thank you for, uh, for letting me in to thank Richard Lyle, to thank Archie of Scotland, to thank everybody for all the work they're doing uh, on the cross-party group. But I think that the, the, the point I want to make is that um, we all need to work together at all various levels of government to make sure we get this right. Thanks very much. The last of the open debate contributions is from Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I congratulate Richard Lyle on <coughs> for bringing this important debate forward. And I too welcome Alzheimer's Scotland's report, which has given us bold and wealth worthwhile recommendations to act upon. For loved ones and their families, a diagnosis of dementia, as with many other illnesses, can open the door to a host of worries and burdens. It spells the beginning of the progressive and difficult journey of a worsening disease. It takes individuals and their families where they do not want to go. And I know from my time as the chairman of Argyle and Butte's Integrated Joint Board how difficult this is for them. And I congratulate Alzheimer's Scotland on their centres and their use of art, music and singing, which are all most uh, helpful uh, in the life of these people. I have previously touched upon some of the consequences of these challenges in this chamber. And indeed, financial scammers often maximize on the vulnerability of those living with dementia. As I said then, initiatives sponsored by groups such as Life Changes Trust raise awareness of simple solutions, telephone call blockers, for example, which can make the world of difference to those living with dementia. But the focus of today's debate is how we respond to dementia and when it reaches an advanced stage. And it is at this point that sufferers are in a critical need of reliable and helpful practices that will guide them in the right path of care. But every response must be founded upon an accurate definition of its symptoms, as the, as the Alzheimer's Scotland's report suggests. With memory loss is perhaps its most significant label. Over time, it sadly stems into greater and more serious health, uh, health setbacks and such as Pick's disease, which my brother-in-law and armed forces veterans had and received the most fantastic care at the Erskine care home during his latter days. And with advanced dementia comes a range of complex health issues and needs layered upon another. <clears throat> the, de the demon of dementia is a continuous changing and deteriorating nature and the needs of a person and their families change as they learn to grapple with the disease and its increasing challenges. This is, has not been translated into government policy and practices and this is what this port, the report seeks to change. It is right that the dementia sufferers are encouraged to live as independently as possible with help from their families and carers, but with advanced dementia, their needs absolutely must be recognized as more challenging and deserving of clear policies and care free at the point of use. The experience of living with advanced dementia uh, does not look the same for every person. But, should, we should be, but what should be universally accepted is that at this stage of the illness, the need goes far beyond social care and has already been highlighted by previous speakers. A health problem must be met with the right solution, health care. And in the past, it is assumed that these health risks and worsening forgetfulness were down to the aging process. Thankfully, we have come a long way on from that mindset which, with much greater awareness. We have seen an increase in funding for Scottish researchers to find possible new ways of treating the condition, but we still we seem to be gra uh, we see a gaping hole in Scotland's policies when it comes to the advanced stage of the illness. The heart of the problem is a marked difference between dementia and other terminal and progressive illnesses in terms of how they are viewed and the care they receive. While other illnesses such as cancer are quite rightly met with high standards of free health care and end of life treatment for those with dementia comes with a considerable cost and varying guidelines in place. This is despite the fact that there, are not, there is not one treatment which can either cure or slow the deterioration of dementia and there are many other major illnesses. Uh, the en estimated scope of cost in social care for families with dementia points to this inequality. And every year, those with advanced dementia living in care homes have to pay around £49 million for the social care they receive in response to their illnesses. The large sum speaks for itself. It lays a bare the burden and complexity of decision-making that these, people's fa these people face. The approach uh, to advanced uh, dementia care needs to be redirected into a transparent, and specific model of care free from financial worry. And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, for those living with dementia care, dementia in Scotland, life can be challenging enough. They neither need nor deserve the added complexities and burdens of costs and social care. The quality of life should not be hampered by confusing and varying procedures that do not recognize their health problem for what it is. They require expert health care services provided on a free and equal basis. Thank you. <clears throat> 
and now call on Claire Hawhey to wind up the debate, please, for around seven minutes, Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I, too, would like to add my thanks to Richard Lyle for bringing this motion to the Chamber for debate. And I'd like to thank all of the members who have given some very valuable contributions to the debate this evening. I welcome Alzheimer's Scotland's Severe Dementia Care Report. And I agree with the motion that the report is an important contribution to the public debate on how we improve dementia care and services, and in particular, our understanding of advanced dementia. I also agree with the proposition in the report and motion that it is crucial that people with dementia at all stages of the illness, including advanced dementia, have the right to equal access to high quality expert care and health services that they need on an equal basis with other progressive conditions. This right is regardless of whether they're at home, in residential care, specialist NHS care or in acute settings. And of course, I agree with the report and motion that the healthcare interventions should at all times be free at the point of use. The government has previously welcomed the Fair Dementia Care report and we are giving careful consideration to its recommendations and we are engaging with Alzheimer's Scotland, COSLA and others on those. Many of the recommendations in the Fair Dementia Care report are being considered as part of our work to change and improve adult social care support in Scotland. As a mental health nurse with over 30 years of experience, I've seen many changes in how we deliver services. My first job as a staff nurse was in a long-term care of the elderly ward. Most of those patients suffered from some form of dementia, but most of them would nowadays be cared for in their own homes with social care support, others in residential or nursing, care, nursing home settings, but more homely settings and closer to their own communities, their family and their friends. Presiding officers, things have moved on greatly in that time and we know that the demand for social care support is growing due to, in part, our ageing population. So it's important that we have a social care system that fits today's needs and is well placed for developments and demands to come. And crucially, a system that focuses on the people using the support rather than the processes that deliver it. And that's why we're working with people who use social care support, carers, COSLA, and a wide range of partners from across the sector to develop a national programme to support local reform of adult social care support. Emerging priorities from the evidence include a shared agreement on the purpose of social care support, equity of experience across Scotland, transparency of systems, processes and decisions, and raising awareness of social care support and its value for individuals and for Scotland, and valuing and supporting the workforce. The Fair Dementia Report makes a series of recommendations on social care support charging, including consistency of charging. And as part of the reform programme, we will also explore the cost of care and how it's paid for. We will develop a process for working collectively to consider alternative models for funding social care that will support Scotland's people into the future. And our models must enable investment at both ends of the scale in intensive care and support needs and in lower needs care and preventative support. The programme is identifying some of the key areas for reform so that we can make smart and sustainable changes to ensure our social care support is fit for the future. Delivering high quality health care, health and care for people living with dementia at all stages of the illness and in all settings is a high priority for this government and the foundation of our three national dementia strategies since 2010. Over this time, we have received international praise for our approach to dementia policy in Scotland, including our world-leading national approach to post-diagnostic support. The Fair Dementia Care Report is concerned in particular with access to health care for people with dementia in care homes. And I agree it is important that an individual's access to high quality dementia care should not depend on where they reside. I would highlight to members the major Care Inspectorate Report of 2017, which focused on 145 care homes. It found good progress, in particular in the provision and quality of person-centred care and personalised care plans. Our 2017 to 2020 National Dementia Strategy continues to focus on key areas such as post-diagnostic support, integrated home care, with an additional focus on the advanced stages of the illness, including palliative and end-of-life care. We're continuing to help educate and train the workforce on the complexities of dementia care, including in its advanced stages. And we also continue to take national action in support of people with dementia in acute care. 
We are working with Alzheimer's Scotland and NHS boards to support the Alzheimer's Scotland Dementia Nurse Consultants Programme. They have been hugely important in driving strategic local change in acute dementia care. The 2015 to 18 report was published yesterday and it set out the achievements by the nurse consultants over that period in key areas such as helping to embed and lead expertise in dementia care and develop staff expertise. The range of action led by the consultants includes improved person centre care and improved responses to stress and distress in acute care and improved linkages to other care settings and the community. So I was pleased yesterday to confirm Yes, I'll take an intervention. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the, the Minister. And I welcome um, uh, all of what she said in terms of developments. Um, but obviously one of the, the concerns that was raised was a, <coughs> a lack of uh, clarity, perhaps consistency around the, uh, the charging regimes operated by uh, local authorities across the country. I wonder uh, what work has been done alongside perhaps COSLA uh, to try and great, create that uh, greater degree of clarity and perhaps consistency. Claire Hockey. Uh, I thank Liam MacArthur for that intervention and yes he, he's, he's absolutely right I think um, the, the report highlights that and I think he highlighted that in his speech. Adult social care reform programme is, is looking at a range of areas to promote greater consistency and clarity um, and ensuring that those um, who need the care and support understand what, what, the, what the system can provide and, and the costs that, that that may well entail. Um, so yesterday I was pleased to confirm that the Scottish Government will continue its funding support for the nurse consultants in this financial year. The successful integration of health and social care support is crucial for people with dementia to ensure more people with the illness can stay at home or in a homely environment for longer, to avoid unnecessary admissions to hospital and ensure they're discharged when they need to leave hospital. So I was also pleased to announce yesterday at Alzheimer's Scotland's conference that we will be funding and working with Inverclyde Health and Social Care Partnership to test how we deliver high quality integrated dementia care at scale. In addition, of course, that we are taking a range of actions to support this agenda, including extending free personal care for everyone under 65, including people with dementia, of course, and implementing the Carers Act and the living wage. President Officer, in conclusion, I would just like to thank members for their contributions today. I think this has been a really measured and thoughtful debate. Um, I welcome the contributions from, from across the political spectrum, and I hope that this is, this is an indication of the cross-party consensus that we can have in helping to improve the lives of people with dementia and supporting their families. So, thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and this meeting is closed.